This is another Eye Raw podcast. Hi, welcome to Storytelling Animals, a podcast of climate, ecology, and animal justice, where we use books to think about a path forward in our ecological crisis. Um, my name is Dayton Martindale, I'm your host, and today we're talking about CRISPR and genetic engineering. Um, as I'm sure many of you have heard of, CRISPR is a tool to make fine, letter, fine level alterations in an organism's DNA. Um, to discuss this tool and the long history of genetic engineering that led up to it, um, I'm speaking with biologist Matthew Cobb, who is the author of several books, most recently, As Gods, A Moral History of the Genetic Age. Um, it's a thrilling book, one of the best I've read all year, um, and the interview is fascinating too, I'm sure you'll learn a lot. Um, in the first third of the interview or so, we go through the history of genetic engineering, go back to the 1970s, um, and talk about how geneticists are some of the only scientists, maybe the only, to have voluntarily placed temporary halts on certain type of research for fear that, you know, something would go wrong. Um, and then in the, maybe the second third of the podcast, we talk about CRISPR and, you know, what it can do and the rather harrowing ethics of using CRISPR to alter human DNA. Um, and then in the final third, we look to other applications, um, such as to rain in mosquito populations, conservation applications that would potentially rein in um, non-native species, uh, applications to bring back extinct species, such as the woolly mammoth, um, and also disease research that uh, can also be dangerous by creating more dangerous diseases. Um, so. Yeah, it's, it's, I think, the longest episode I've put out, um, but it's a good one. Cobb is both a gifted technical guide to the issues surrounding this um, and also a spirited commentator on the ethical dimensions of all this, um, and um, I hope you'll enjoy. A quick note before we start, um, the December Storytelling Animals Book Club was postponed to January, so on January 17th, we will be discussing... An Immense World by Ed Young, which is about how animals see, perceive and sense the world. Um, it's been winning a bunch of awards, shortlisted for awards. Um, so I'm really excited about it and hope you'll join us January 17th. For more details on that, go to my website, uh, follow me on Twitter, jump on my newsletter, um, or subscribe to this podcast on Patreon with a small monthly donation to keep it going and keep me going. One final note, I was having technical issues with my microphone during this interview and my audio is not great, um, but Matthew Cobb sounds great and he does most of the talking as usual for my guests. So um, please forgive me and without further ado, here's the interview. author of As Gods, A Moral History of the Genetic Age. Matthew, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's great to be here, Dayton. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, so um, A Moral History of the Genetic Age, the, I believe in the UK, the title is simply The Genetic Age. Um, what, what do you mean by The Genetic Age? Well, I was trying to, it, it seemed to me that with the invention of genetic engineering 50 years ago, the world entered a, a new phase and it's kind of a nod to the idea of the atomic age, which uh, after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, changed the way the world looked, what it thought about itself, altered culture. It wasn't just a technological, in that case, military innovation, but it had huge ramifications throughout society, industry, the whole capitalist system. And it struck me that the arrival of genetic engineering and then eventually its application, eventually very quickly its application, uh, led to a similar kind of shift. And I thought there were also interesting parallels in the way that irrespective of what's happening in the Ukraine at the moment, we are much less worried about the atomic age than we used to be. Uh, and similarly, I think that there's been a decline in fear and worries associated with genetic engineering, uh, which is 
in one part really good and there's also some aspects that I think are rather concerning and people should be know about and should be slightly alarmed by the possibility of what could happen so it was kind of a nod to a nod to the atomic age but also to emphasize that I think we we entered a new a new phase of culture and society uh, in 1972 with the first genetic engineering experiments. Mm -hmm. um, so you are a biologist and, you know, once in a while you pop up throughout the narrative, but what, uh, what do you research and just kind of what has been your interaction with the rise of, of genetic engineering technologies? Uh, yeah. I mean, I've been a, I've been an observer, <laughs> so I haven't been a, a driver or a, uh, anybody who's been involved directly, I've used its products uh, as a scientist. But uh, as somebody who I went to university in the mid 1970s, at the same time as this technology was becoming uh, not only real, but also was attracting uh, controversy and producing debate. And I observed and read about those debates at the time and then subsequently remarked on what was happening throughout the the next half century in terms of the scientific and political developments and yeah i mean i some reviewers have found it a bit uh, over much i do insert myself a few every now and again into the into the the, the text i mean the main reason to that is not is not kind of self aggrandizement but rather simply trying to make this history which is history, also personal, because for many of the, well, some of the readers, this is their lives, in particular the scientists who I interviewed. You know, I was actually describing their whole career. So it was also a way of trying to make, bring some of the details or the changes that I was describing to bring them to life, to give my own personal uh, insight into that, uh, such as it is. In terms of the way I have used genetic engineering, the main way, uh, has been through my work on Drosophila. So I study the, the tiny fruit fly, or vinegar fly, we should really call it, uh, a tiny vinegar fly called Drosophila, which was the, the insect that was used to really bring genetics from the, the, the Mendelian period when people were studying peas, and then the vague uncertainty when it, these ideas were rediscovered at the beginning of the 20th century, to actually make it into a proper science and to show, for example, that genes were on chromosomes. It's one of the key things that Drosophila was able to do. I got interested in this at the same time as genetic engineering was coming along, uh, not by genetic engineering, but by straightforward old fashioned mutation. Uh, a study was done in, uh, in Pasadena in which they showed that they could create a mutant fly that couldn't learn. And as somebody who was, this is 1976, as somebody who was interested in behavior and learning as an example of behavior, I thought this was fascinating and astonishing that you could make a mutation changing a single letter of DNA and you would produce an insect that couldn't learn. I thought, I want to do that. And I was lucky enough to be able to do it. So I have used transgenic flies. These have been flies that contain uh, genes from a jellyfish which would produce green fluorescent protein. So they glow green if you, if you shine a fluorescent light on them. And those fluorescent genes or the fluorescent proteins, the genes that encode them, are under the control of a system from yeast. So we've got a fly with control genes from yeast expressing or controlling the expression of genes from jellyfish. And that means that you can make certain cells, just perhaps one cell in the whole fly, or the whole larva, which is mainly what I've studied, just one cell light up, and you know exactly what gene is expressed in that particular cell. So I, I, that's the way I've used it. Uh, not as, not in any, um, it's entirely in a passive way. I haven't created these strains. Other people have done all the hard work. So you write in the introduction that um, you were kind of motiv motivated to write this book by uh, three particular concerns you have about applying um, CRISPR technology. But uh, the, the book starts much earlier than CRISPR. Um, so, you know, in the 70s or even was it 60s that people are really first starting to figure this out, what, you know, what was ge genetic engineering? What did it look like then? Um, and what were some of the initial concerns people had? Well, by today's standards, it was pretty crude, as you'd expect. Any technology, its initial, you know, its birth is dramatic because it can do something amazing but later on looks pretty clunky. I mean, if you look back at your 
your first iPhone, uh, whether that was two years ago or 10 years ago, it looks pretty crappy compared to the latest spiffy version. Um, so what you could do with genetic engineering at the beginning, this was uh, a consequence of work done by Paul Berg at Stansted, work that won in the Nobel Prize eight years later, was to introduce DNA uh, from a bacterium, uh, E. coli, which lives in our guts, into a virus. So you've got now got a virus with a known piece of DNA, some DNA that had been intensely studied in the bacterium and which its function was known pretty much entirely, which was very rare in those days. This was before any DNA sequencing, but they had been able, using a series of enzymes and techniques that had been developed over the previous years, to take this piece of DNA that they knew a lot about to put it into a virus. And the reason they wanted to do that was the virus would infect mammalian cells, and virtually nothing was known about what genes do in mammalian cells. So they thought, okay, we can get this weird bacterial gene that we understand, use the virus as a vector, put it into the mammalian cell line. So this would be just a patch of cells that you grow on a, an agar plate. And then we will be able to see what this known, whether this known function is carried over into a mammalian cell or whether something else happens. So it was a tool in order to be able to understand something deeper, which is how genes work in mammalian cells. And what happened was that very quickly, people were able to use this technique to develop it. In particular, Herb Boyer and Stanley Cohen, Cohen at, Stan at Stanford and Herb Boyer at the University of California, uh, San Francisco, they adapted it slightly and using tiny uh, chromosomes called plasmids, which exist inside bacteria, they could use the plasmids, they could put, the, put DNA into plasmids and then move the plasmids from one bacterium to another. And thereby, effectively, as Berg said when he heard about this, this adaptation of his method, uh, said, well, now anybody can do anything. Now, that was quite alarming. And in fact, the alarm bells had rung even before this. So before Berg did his any experiment in 1971, he not only planned to do the experiment he was really interested in, which is trying to get E. coli DNA into a mammalian cell using this virus as a vector. He gave a project of kind of doing the opposite experiment to a PhD student, that is to just to see whether it would work. He wanted to get the DNA from SV40, which is the virus he was using, and put it into E. coli. So it's the opposite experiment of what he was really interested in. And why that was alarming, before it had even been done, was that SV40 was thought to perhaps cause cancer in humans. It certainly caused cancer in mammalian cell lines. So the worry was, and it was Bob Pollack, who's a young researcher at Cold Spring Harbor on the, west, on the East Coast, who heard about this experiment from the student, Janet Mertz, who was planning to do it. And he phoned up Berg, who he didn't know, <laughs> picked up the phone and said, why are you doing this crazy experiment? Because what that would mean is that you were potentially putting a cancer-causing gene into E. coli, which is a bacterium that lives in our guts. So what Pollack was concerned about was, well, you could get cancer through this system. So whilst the main experiment that Berg wanted to do was quite anodyne and would lead to greater insight, this other experiment, which was frankly pointless, apart from to give to a PhD student to keep her busy, was quite worrying. Um, and Mertz actually, over the next week, she thought about it and she said, she recalled thinking, I don't want to be involved in this. This is actually quite scary. Why would I do this? So she decided not to do the experiment anyway. Berg although he was pretty cross when he got this phone call from this nobody questioning his, his authority. The two people, they're, they're about 15 years apart. So, you know, there was, there was kind of all seniority and all sorts of things playing into that. Um, Berg eventually talked to a lot of people who all went, well, you know what, it's pretty unlikely, but why, why take the risk? So Berg, in fact, decided not to do the experiment without anybody knowing, apart from Bob Pollack and a handful of other people. So, there have been four such moments in the history of genetic engineering when scientists have decided not to do research because it might be dangerous. And this first one happened without anybody knowing about it. It was completely done in private. The second pause came 
with this new development by Boyer and Cohen of this new, what became called, known as cloning, a way of cloning recombinant DNA, this was called. Recombinant DNA just means it's a, a, from two different sources. Now, normally a recombinant organism is like you or me. We're recombinant between our parents, yeah? But these things that were mixtures of DNA from viruses and bacteria, that was completely a different kind of recombinant DNA. And that term became used generally for a long time to describe the product of what was called genetic engineering, mixing up DNA from completely different types of organism. And when people really thought about the possibilities of the Boyer-Cohen method of cloning for getting DNA from any kind of species and sticking it into a bacterium and who knows what would happen, they began to become alarmed that inadvertently researchers might create new diseases or you know ecological havoc or whatever. So there was a lot of pushback in the scientific community in 19, end of 1973, beginning of 1974, and that led the National Academies of Science to ask Berg to set up a working group to decide what to do. And Berg and the rest of the scientists decided, OK, we're going to call for a moratorium. That is a pause in research. Uh, and we'll have a meeting at Asilomar, Cinema, which is where Stanford had its usual kind of, you know, out of out of university conferences. So Berg knew it really well. This site on the Californian coast, beautiful old uh, YMCA center with all beautiful old chapel as a meeting room. And um, they decided they'd have this meeting in February 1975. And that was the second research pause that took place. And this was very, very public. Everybody around the world knew this was huge debates in Europe, in America, about whether this was the right thing to do and whether you should even allow genetic engineering under any circumstances because of these fears about potential diseases and potential ecological consequences. So you read that geneticists are the only group of scientists to voluntarily pause their work in the way that you're describing. Other than the fact of the, the dangers of it, there, there are probably other sciences that have dangers too. Uh, why do you think this is? Well, in a, in a way, um, so there, there are two aspects. Firstly, the kind of technical one is, yes, uh, accidents are possible, right? All technology contains not only benefits, but threats. Those threats are generally pretty minute or hard to identify. But an accident, you know, take a, take a car, that's pretty obvious. With a car, you can have an accident. But as Seymour, Sidney Brenner, who was one of the leading lights of the Asilomar meeting, he was a South African geneticist who worked in the UK, in Cambridge, uh, as he said in giving evidence to the British House of Commons about this in the mid-1970s, the difference between genetic technology and these other forms of technology is that with traditional technology, accidents tend not to be self-replicating. So that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Bad things can happen with chemistry, with nuclear power, whatever, but you're just going to have one bad thing. But if something goes bad with genetics, then the thing you have made bad <laughs> can replicate, can reproduce itself. You might not be able okay. to get it back. So that is the key thing, I think, that has led people to be very, very wary of simply saying, OK, well, we'll fix it. Don't worry. Or we can be really careful and it'll all be fine. And has led to these four moments, uh, 1971, 1974, 2011, and most recently, uh, 2019, when there have been calls for a search pause. Now, so that's the kind of technical reason. But I think there's also an interesting sociological reason. And that's partly the people who were involved in this panel, in particular Berg and David Baltimore, um, who a few years later also won a Nobel Prize. I mean, they, they were definitely of the left, although they were, I mean, Berg was older than, uh, than Baltimore. But Baltimore, uh, he told me how when he made his key discovery, which was he won the Nobel Prize for, which was discovering this enzyme that can turn RNA into DNA. So it was a key kind of bit of genetic toolkit that he did, invented or discovered. Um, that was in the middle of a whole series of uh, anti-war protests at MIT. And he divided his time between in the lab and then going out and trying to stop his students getting arrested, as well as protesting himself uh, against the war. So these were people who had a, 
you know, a radical. I'm not ex- without exaggeration too much. I mean, they weren't uh, they, they they weren't ultra radical, but they were part of the general movement and just not you know being critical about what they were doing, which was part of culture at the time. This was the rise of the counterculture. There were lots of arguments about the worth and value of science. Um, whilst we tend to think about, oh, well, that's the era of Apollo, you know, they, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin la- land on the moon. We've also got, uh, you know, we, we, we've also got protests about that. There's the, the black community, which is protesting about, about the their relative poverty. There's Gil Scott's Heron, Scott Heron's Whitey's, Whitey's on the Moon poem in which he protests about the, the poverty of the black community while Whitey's on the moon. So there's a, there's a, a moment which looks kind of odd now in US culture, where this critique was very, very strong. And that was just part of the, the bubbling atmosphere that the scientists who were involved in Asilomar were, were feeling, sensing, were kind of part of. So it was a ripe time for that kind of response. And now it's, well, not a tradition, but it's it's taught. So geneticists are taught about Asilomar. They learn about it. And Geneticists are rightly proud, I think, of this moment of self-regulation in which important decision was taken not to go ahead with experiments because they might be dangerous until you could find the right ways of doing them, the, the experiments safely. Uh, so it's kind of a known part of our culture. And that hasn't happened in any other science. So even the atomic scientists working on the Manhattan Project, they were very worried after the defeat of Nazi Germany that there was now no point in building this thing and it would just kill people. Why would you want to do it? Uh, they protested. They wrote a letter of protest to Roosevelt, but mysteriously it was never delivered. Um, more significantly, they never actually stopped work. They Even the most critical scientists carried on with the Manhattan Project. So that's a big difference between genetics at a different time with different people uh, and with a different technology and probably the most destructive technology we've ever developed so far. Uh, which is atomic weapons. So in some ways, it seems like maybe this went well, uh, which is that they did have you know, some measure of self-regulation among scientists. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the fears people had don't seem for the most part to have come to pass. Um, yeah. But I guess you also have some some thoughts about what they could have done better. And in particular, uh, not just self-regulating among scientists, but also bringing the public into dialogue. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so, I mean, Asilomar was very significant. We had this self-regulation where after the Berg letter, as it was called, because he was the first signatory, uh, in 1974 was published, scientists all over the world, as far as we know, or well, certainly civilian scientists, stopped work on this field. They they waited. There's no evidence that anybody broke the embargo or the moratorium. At Asilomar, the sole point of discussion that was allowed was what under what conditions can we restart the experiments? In other words, it was entirely oriented to security. And David Baltimore, at the beginning of the meeting, explicitly said, we will not allow any discussion about bioweapons, even though he recognized this was the most potentially the most dangerous development or application of genetic engineering. They wouldn't allow any discussion about the potential for engineering humans, and they wouldn't allow any discussion of environmental consequences. So it's solely focused on, you know, what kind of risks are we prepared to take? And they, this was to, in one way, really good because they were getting into the nitty gritty and they were looking at how they could make this safe. On the other hand, they did not discuss whether it was the right thing to do. They wouldn't have that discussion. Now, what's striking is that we now know, well, we knew at the time there was a Russian delegation at, or Soviet delegation at the, uh, at Asilomar. And these were all uh, learned members of the Academy of Sciences. They were all people who are even older than I am. And the young American kind of hotshots who were there at the cinema, you know, were literally laughing at the, the Soviets, saying things like, oh, well, you know, these guys don't know anything. You know, they're not hiding anything. They just don't understand. But we now know that three of the Soviet delegation, the leaders of the Soviet delegation at the cinema, had already convinced President Brezhnev to start a genetic engineering bioweapons program in the USSR. And this was real. It employed tens of thousands of people in the end and was murderously successful. They were able to produce some horrendous new weapons 
in secret without the West having any idea at all. So the things that Asilomar didn't want to discuss were actually really important. And they are now, I think, very important. You know, they're of actuality, environmental consequences, human genetic engineering and the potential for you know, new pandemics, new diseases being created either accidentally or maliciously. So the, the key thing, however, was the public wasn't present. There were journalists there. Uh, and there were, but the deal was the journalists could record the proceedings, but they weren't allowed to publish articles until the end. So a series of articles, a fantastic article um, published in uh, by Michael Roberts in uh, Rolling Stone. That was the best uh, of the journalistic production that came out, about 12 page article called the Pandora's Box Congress. You can find PDFs of it uh, on the Internet. Uh, and he went on to write a brilliant book about the whole thing called Biohazard. Um, but the the public was not involved directly. This was just scientists saying these are the conditions that we think can be done safely. And we recommend that the National Institutes of Health, which in the US is the main funder of biological and biomedical research, that the National, National Institutes of Health should um, refuse to fund anybody who doesn't abide by these criteria. So that wasn't even anything that applied outside of the US. And it wasn't anything that applied to the private sector in the US. So it was quite a narrow kind of victory. But it was a victory in that the UK adopted very similar protocols. So did um, uh, so did uh, various European countries. And even the Soviet Union made sure that it had the NAH protocols well on uh, well on display when people naive Western visitors came and visited Soviet molecular genetics labs uh, afterwards. So there was no public involvement at Asilomar. After Asilomar. After Asilomar, then that led to a huge debate uh, involving big town hall meetings, in particular in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where MIT wanted to build uh, a new uh, lab. It was Harvard, sorry. Harvard wanted to build a new lab and that caused a huge ruckus and there was a big debate about whether it was possible and the public were very much so involved. There were public hearings, big debates, it's quite a kind of jamboree affair. And the result of that was that this panel of ordinary citizens, uh, including a physics PhD student and a nun, um, this panel of ordinary citizens said, OK, that seems actually uh, probably going to be safe and we think it can go ahead. Ironically, the lab was never built because it had taken so long that by the time the lab was built, the techniques that it uh, was designed to do to, 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 to use could now be carried out in much lower level secure biosecurity and the whole thing was turned into offices at a cost of millions so it's a whole way that's the thing was really in a way it was a waste of time because what had happened was that in the second half of the 70s the biosecurity protocols protocols established at Asilomar were effective nobody died no new diseases were created it turned out that one of the things that people were really worried about which was the introduction of human genes into bacterium bacteria if that happened nothing would happen because our genes in fact the genes of all multicellular organisms are chopped up in little bits our cells know how to remove the bits that are junk and to stick the gene back together just before it gets uh, made to function but bacterial cells don't know how to do that so if you put a whole human gene into a bacterial cell it would just go does not compute and metabolize the whole thing. So, you know, that was quite a chance discovery in 1977. Nobody had any idea of that. So that was quite reassuring. The final element was that it turned out there was lots of money to be made because uh, in particular, Herb Boyer um, had the guy who had invented or co-invented cloning. He uh, teamed up with a, a guy called Bob Swanson, uh, who was a, a late uh, an unemployed venture capitalist in his late 20s with no money he was you know unemployed and he had this brilliant idea of using recombinant dna to make drugs in particular insulin this was his idea and he persuaded boyer uh in 75 to go along with this and they set up a startup uh called genentech it was incorporated the same week as apple just down the road in silicon valley so this is all part of the atmosphere you know um and eventually they succeed, well, very quickly, they succeeded brilliantly 
in persuading uh, bacteria to accept the presence of synthetic DNA that corresponded not to the actual human gene, say for insulin, because they didn't know what that looked like, but a gene that corresponded to the protein. Uh, so without all the, the bits that are, in fact get chopped out in our cells. So it wasn't actually insulin, it was a precursor of insulin, it doesn't really matter. But this worked brilliantly. And this they could then sell this to the drug companies, Lilly, for example, and that's the origin of all insulin. Everybody who today uses insulin, it is made in a genetically modified organism that uses this brilliant idea from the Genentech scientists. Um, and this was better than the traditional insulin because that had come from uh, animal pancreases and animal insulin isn't exactly the same as ours. So you were getting something that was purer, better. You couldn't get it any other way. The Genentech scientists made this, they sold the, the product to, uh, they made, they've licensed it to, to Lilly, they produced the drug, promises of, you know, vastly reduced prices. Oddly enough, that hasn't happened in the USA, has happened in the UK, in the USA. So other things are going on. But anyway, Genentech, they then decided like all good startups in about 79, okay, let's sell the company because we've made a load of money. We can make a load of money. Let's just sell it to one of the big pharma companies. Nobody wanted to buy it. Their, you know, their business plan of more genetic engineering was too weird for the big pharma companies. They didn't get it. So Swanson and Boyer and the other investors said, okay, well, we'll go public. So they had uh, an OPA on uh, Wall Street and it was the biggest sale that Wall Street had ever seen. Later on that year, it was dwarfed by Apple. But again, it was that period. You know, you could suddenly, and Boyer did, become filthy rich, unbelievably wealthy uh, overnight. So this was seen as a new form of capitalism, a new form of industrial production. You've turned microbes into mini factories. They can churn out this stuff and you can then harvest it. And there was huge hopes that this would change, well, everything. Plus, of course, the speculation was making some people very, very rich. All this at a time that... Reagan had just come to power and was in Thatcher in the UK, and they were keen on deregulating the economy, getting rid of all the regulations and controls, encouraging or forcing, in fact, universities in the US to use the patents, to license the patents that they had owned. The Supreme Court said, yes, you can patent an organism. So it became possible now to, to patent and license the product of your genetic engineering brilliance, and everybody got wealthy. Well, some people did. So for all those reasons, uh, the 1980s, you know, that was a that was a time, man, when some people did very well and attitudes began to change. Yeah, it's, you know, on the one hand, like getting, you know, better insulin that people respond to better is is a success story. But also, you know, how sure are we that people should be getting rich off of product people need to survive? Yeah. Um, that, that's a that's a that's a different issue, and you've got a. I mean, I think the scientists would say, "Hey, we just had the idea." You know, these uh, deep socio-economic political issues. Do you want communism or do you want capitalism? You're going to have to figure that out yourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which which I think is something that we'll talk about later. Which is that you know, yes, a lot of these scientific technical advances are are great and useful, but that some of the problems they're addressing, genetic solutions, are not the only type of uh, way to Absolutely. respond. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it maybe just before we get into that, um, I, I want to maybe, you know, there's a lot we're going to fast forward through, I think, kind of this, this history of, of pre-CRISPR genetic advances. It, is, it was something I really didn't know much about and was one of the most exciting parts of the book. Um, and, you know, at times you know, in a positive way, at times in an alarming way. But um, I think. Well, yeah, good. Because I, I must say that, <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm not at all an entrepreneurial guy. Let's just put it that way. You know, I'm not particularly interested in, you know, startups and so on. But reading about Genentech, reading about her boy and Bob Swanson, it was so exciting, seriously. I mean, it, both the, the scientific genius, but also the, the gambles they took, the insight, uh, I found that pretty exciting. Similarly, uh, the the creation of GM crops, which I knew nothing about. And in fact, no historian has actually studied, bizarrely. I mean, this really significant piece of both science and agro-capitalism and 
the social consequences of that around the world with all the protests there were at the end of the cent last century. Um, that again was researching that and talking to the people who were involved in it um, and getting their side of the story again was really very exciting and I, I knew nothing about that and there is no there's no literature on the on the GM story uh, that you can actually read that is in any way doing anything except focusing on oh my god either it's gonna it's gonna kill us all or it's gonna save us all neither of which are true but the actual steps and the reasons why in particular Monsanto were doing the whole thing that I which is just to be very brief Monsanto which quite rightly gets a very bad press uh, because of its subsequent behavior, the starting point was they wanted to get out of chemicals. They thought that producing insecticides was unsustainable and that it had to stop. The planet wouldn't accept it. The public wouldn't accept it. So they came up with this brilliant idea of getting plants to produce their own organic insecticide, which would mean, and it has meant, that millions of tons less insecticide has been sprayed around the planet. Uh, and so an awful lot of insects have been saved because of this very smart technology. And as somebody who's spent his whole career studying insects, I think that's good. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the themes, whether it's GM crops or, or anything else you, you talk about in the book, is kind of what you said. It, it didn't end up killing us all, but it also didn't end up delivering all of the benefits that maybe were promised. Does that feel like a fair assessment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no heart. You can eat, eat GM crops. It's not going to do any harm at all. Um, the problem associated, problems associated with them is and the staggering fact, which I was very surprised at, is that U, U.S. Department of Agriculture figures show that productivity, so the amount of you know grain or whatever you get per acre, has not gone up, has not changed. It's the same. The reason for, as it was before we had GM crops, I mean, for example, you know, virtually all uh, all corn in the U.S. is GM. Virtually all cotton in the U.S. is GM. Uh, and this is either to stop in insects from eating the crop, which is great because that works, or uh, rather less pleasant is the use of uh, herbicides. And then you create a plant that can resist the herbicide. So basically you can spray the field and it kills all the weeds. Unfortunately, it also has run off you know, if there's the stuff runs into the into water courses then it has terrible effects on amphibians and so on so there are big downsides plus nature is you know evolu as the the evolutionary as the as the geneticist leslie orgel said uh, evolution is smarter than you are so what's happened is that we now have resistant strains of both insect and herbicide so, which don't respond anymore to these clever uh, creations uh, above all, however, the reason why there hasn't been a, an increase in productivity is that the strains of plant that they have been able to satisfactorily introduce the genes into are not necessarily the most productive ones. So basically, you've gained at one side, but you've lost at another. And the overall result is pretty much the same. Furthermore, despite kind of hopes uh, for, you know, solving the solving, you know, solving the, the world's feed food food problems and providing better greater providing better food security to people around the world uh in these crops are really designed for large scale monocultures uh, like you have in the midwest in the us they don't scale to in particular um sharecroppers uh you know smallholders who've just got a very small area of land and they don't work well in that situation and the experience in Africa has largely been that although in some countries big farms have taken it up, uh, the small farmers have always very quickly said, look, this isn't working. We'd rather have our traditional crops and take the risk with the caterpillars um, and the weeds. So, yeah, and um, there's maybe, a, you know, not exact parallels, but similar stories and at least some of the medical applications you cover. Gene therapy is something we probably don't have time to get into the weeds on, but um, where a lot of people got very excited about new genetic technologies for addressing diseases that didn't necessarily end up better than existing treatments or anything else. Well, they, I mean, well, there were some there were some examples of people being, in particular, children bubble babies. So you know, we've all heard of these children who are born with damaged 
uh, immune system. They've got genetic problem, which means that their immune system uh, prevent them from responding to infection properly. And so they, in the ordinary way of things, they would die very, very young. They can be kept alive literally in a bubble as long as they don't where the air is filtered and so on. And in particular in Paris, at the turn of the century, there are, I think, a dozen children were cured of this genetic, genetic disease by the use of gene therapy, by introducing, by using a viral vector, much like Paul Berg had wanted to do, using a virus containing the right version of the gene to insert that somewhere into the children's genome. The problem was, much as the problem has been with, with GM crops, is you can't control that insertion. And indeed, sometimes some viruses want to go. They have what are called hotspots that are parts of the genome they're particularly attracted to for various reasons. And what that meant in some cases, in a couple of cases, in these children who were treated in France, is that the, 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 the virus with its you know, life-saving payload of the correct version of the gene plonked itself in part of the genome that was actually very important. And the disruption of the gene that it found itself in led to leukemia and a couple of these children died. And so the technique was effective, but not sufficiently controlled. And that led to, in the case of humans, I mean, clearly in, a, in the case of a, you know, doing this to a human, you've got to be incredibly sure that it's not going to, it's not going to kill you. Yeah, that's really the the med, you know the the medic's first law is do no harm. So uh, you've got to be confident that this is going to be an effective and a safe procedure, and it eventually became apparent that there wasn't sufficient control for this. And although it's a technique that has been used and can be used, this lack of control is rather alarming. Similarly, in the creation of GM crops, it's that that partly worried people. I don't think for rational reasons, but nonetheless, this was their concern that there were other bits of DNA now in this plant and that maybe the this where the gene was inserted was going to cause mutations or whatever. So that was both both these these flagships of genetic engineering, the application of genetic engineering in the 1990s, both GM crops and uh, gene therapy both suffered from the same weakness which was the method of delivery of the correct version of the gene was not sufficiently controlled. It was rather crude. So what I was saying earlier on about the similarity, you know, technology moving on, this looks like a pretty crude way of doing things compared to what we can now do with CRISPR. Well, that's a perfect segue. Uh, <laughs> what can we now do with CRISPR? There you go. <laughs> what, what's the, you know, the two minute description of, what is CRISPR? Well, CRISPR is often described as gene editing. And that's a really kind of lovely sounding metaphor. It sounds very safe. I mean, you edit on your phone, you edit on a piece of paper. It's just, you know, changing letters. It's not complicated. It's dead easy and safe. Um, in fact, that term was not first used to describe CRISPR. There have been a series of increasingly sophisticated ways of changing single or multiple letters of DNA uh, using different techniques, the first of which were incredibly complicated and very long-winded and hard to achieve, but were brilliant as a breakthrough. I mean, extraordinary pieces of biochemistry that people were able to do to precisely target a given piece of DNA in a genome. And then to, and this is the really clever thing about all these systems and above all how CRISPR works, is that if you chop, if you use an enzyme to cut a piece of DNA, it's got two strands to it, yeah, the double helix, everybody's heard of that. Now, what happens if you cut a piece of DNA is that you've lost, uh, it's not, you don't just chop it, you've actually lost some of the, one of the, at least one of the letters, they get chopped out, it's chemically. Um, and the cell has then got to decide what to do. And depending on, the cells don't like having their DNA cut up, it's not a good thing for them. So they either try and just sticking that they just try sticking the two blunt ends back together and hope for the best and that can sometimes be okay and sometimes it causes a mutation and that's not quite so good the other way which is what crispr relies on is that if the cell is in the right state what the cell can do is to look at it on a particular chromosome so you've got a double helix 
in the, in the chromosome, it looks and it says, oh, I've got a hole here. I've got a gap in this sequence. Now, in organisms that got two pairs of chromosomes, like humans, like plants and so on, it can look at the other sequence, which hasn't been damaged, and say, well, what's there? Ah, it's got that sequence. And often it will use the other sequence, the intact sequence, to repair the damaged bit. Now, if you're very clever, you can persuade the cell not to use that other, that other chromosome, but instead a piece of DNA that you have introduced into the cell. And so what the cell now does is it looks at the damage and says, OK, I can, oh, you've got a piece of DNA here. And the beginning and end of that are like the beginnings and ends of my broken DNA. And there's this middle bit. Oh, I'll use that. And it sticks it in. So if you've been clever and you understand the state of the cell, and I'll sure we'll get on to why I'm emphasizing this so much. It is, in fact, very delicate. So it sounds like editing, but uh, it is, in fact, really complicated. And you've got to understand the system you're working on very well for it to work. Otherwise, other things will happen. But if you get it right, then the cell will now has now got a new sequence inserted there. Not directly. It's not the actual DNA that it's stuck in there, but it's used the information, the genetic information to make a new sequence. So you've literally reprogrammed. To be honest, you know, reprogramming would be better and slightly more alarming than editing. So Fyodor Ernoff, the, 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 the gene therapist who came up with the, the, the term gene editing in 2005, I think, uh, he said to me, oh, he said in public, that maybe it was not a good term because it does sound very reassuring. If we talked about genetic reprogramming, that would have been more accurate because that's what you're doing. You're not just editing it. You're trying to make it do something else. And programming sounds kind of scary, which I think it should. I think we should be scared or we should be wary of this technology. So that's what CRISPR enables you to do. Uh, I mean, CRISPR is an acronym and I'm not going to say what it stands for because unlike <laughs> most acronyms, most acronyms mean something. It tells you something about what you're studying. CRISPR, it doesn't. It refers to the DNA sequences that were identified, weird DNA sequences were identified in bacteria um, in the 19, mid 1980s, in fact, and nobody knew what they were doing. And then eventually, in a whole series of studies in the early years of this century, it was finally worked out that they uh, acted as a kind of vi uh, bacterial immune system and that contained in those sequences were bits of viral DNA that the bacteria had chopped up when it was being attacked by a virus and had stuck into its own DNA as a kind of memory that it could then transmit to its offspring, which would then, if they ever encountered that virus again, recognize it and mobilize molecular scissors that could chop it up. The clever thing, so I remember reading when this all was described, it was published in Science in 2008, and this, you're about to learn why I don't have a Nobel Prize. Because I read this, <laughs> and I thought, okay, so bacteria have got an immune system. That's pretty cool. I don't really care about bacteria. And I turned the page. Everybody else who read that, <laughs> who is a bit sharper than me, thought, hey, what if we replace that viral DNA, so it's targeting a virus, with some DNA that we're interested in? What if we use these chemical tools that the bacteria has evolved to target DNA that we're interested in. And that, to be very, 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 very brief description, is basically what took the next four or five years. And we're just coming up to the 10th anniversary uh, of the publication of Dowden and Charpentier's paper in Science, uh, in which they showed that CRISPR could be programmed. And they did use that term. Uh, CRISPR could be used to pro could be programmed to attack any form of DNA. And then very quickly it was shown this would also work in mammalian cells. And then within months, you had the, the beginnings of the CRISPR explosion. Right. I think the shortcomings of the editing metaphor are important to bring out just because when I read an article at the New York Times or whatever about how CRISPR works, it describes CRISPR working. Um, <laughs> But you, you know, you go through some of these these experiments, and they have, you know, maybe high success rates for doing what they're trying to do, but far from a hundred percent. Which I guess is also true of people who are trying to program computers to do what they want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's that's quite neat. Yes, I mean, the difference. So I explain this to students, uh, and in particular, we now know that in um, mammalian embryos and in particular in primate embryos so in a single cell embryo uh, 
CRISPR can, if the cell isn't in exactly the right state to do the business I've just been describing, to use this bit of extra DNA that you put in there as a, a guide to reconstructing this break, if it's not in exactly the right state, the whole system can kind of go amok and you can lose whole chromosomes. Uh, and this is absolutely terrifying. I mean, there's no way that you'd want to do this on any human cell because you, if you weren't absolutely confident it's going to work because of the consequences. And I explain this to students and then the, you know, the students put their hands up and say, yes, but last week we had a lecture from you know, Dr. So-and-so who explained how marvelously it all worked. And I say, well, A, he would say that because he's not, you know, he's trying to sell, understandably, trying to emphasize the power of this. But also, I mean, if you're working in a fly or even in a mouse, if it goes wrong, well, that's okay. You know, if it goes wrong in a mouse, the mouse embryo will just die. You've got plenty more to study. And so you're going to get the mouse with the correct change coming out. Marvellous. You know, you haven't lost anything in flies. It, you know, it's even, you have even more embryos to, to, to find the right version in. So there are different criteria, I think, for using experimental animals to, for discovery science, just trying to find stuff out. Then you accept very, very low levels of efficacy. But with anything to do with therapy in humans, then clearly we have very different standards and should have. Uh, and so that, that's kind of the difference that's going on here. Um, and the, I think the editing metaphor is, uh, is overly seductive and does lead to overconfident, well, has indeed led to overconfidence by scientists. So the, the metaphor doesn't only seduce the general public, it seduces us, the scientists, too. And we end up thinking that way. Uh, and it's got quite a power to it, which is not entirely good. So as an aside, I would suggest that maybe we should care more about mice, too. But one of the uh, three applications of CRISPR that you said inspired you to write this book is, is that someone did, did it to a human embryo and then implanted that embryo and the embryo was born. Um, yeah. So, you know, it was... People might have heard about this. Um, it was a few years back. A Chinese scientist used CRISPR to edit uh, an embryo. And what I sort of vaguely remember, and what you talk about in the book, is that the the gene he added was meant to prevent HIV infection in the future. And I think to the layperson, it definitely you know it sounds alarming to <laughs> edit a human embryo's genes. Um, but maybe you also think, oh, like if it's trying to prevent an HIV infection, like maybe that's not so bad. But after reading your chapter about it, uh, I, I feel like I had a better sense of, oh, this was a pretty <laughs> reckless and alarming experiment. So can you tell us about, about this? Yeah, this, this was done in, announced in November 2018 at a, the second international, not the title of it, second big international meeting on, on human genome engineering. And a Chinese researcher called He Zhong Kui, who was a very minor uh, player on the you know, he was, he was known, he'd been to various conferences in America and so on, but he wasn't a, he wasn't a big shot in any way. Uh, he announced, in fact, it had been revealed uh, by some very clever uh, journalism by the MIT Technology Review. Uh, Antonio Regalado had managed to sniff out the story before it was announced. Uh, so everybody knew before he spoke what he'd done. He had edited, uh, he said, two embryos. We now know that there was a third one uh, and he'd implanted them and they had come to term. So there were now baby girls born by what he called in a little promotional video, which is still on YouTube, um, he called gene surgery. So it sounds even more reassuring, doesn't it? I mean, because clearly this is about, you know, you only have surgery if you want to be cured of something and you, my God, you trust the surgeon. You have to, you know, he's going to stick it or she's going to stick a knife in you. So uh, this sounds really careful and important. But as you said, what he was trying to do was to alter a gene uh, called uh, CCR5, uh, which is involved in the, the structure of our, of our cells and which there's a particular variant of it, which is present in natural populations. So people have it, which means they are much less likely to get HIV. So right from the beginning of the HIV uh, pandemic, people were very intrigued by certain individuals who engaged in all sorts of risky behavior and yet never seemed to get HIV. And some of these people had this particular mutation. So what uh, He Jong Kui wanted to do was to introduce this mutation. 
Now, the starting point is how do you not get HIV? Well, everybody knows how you can avoid getting HIV. It's very straightforward. You know, there are certain behaviors you don't indulge in and you'll be OK. I mean, there's also the business about not being born to a mother who's got HIV, which you can't have quite so much choice on. But as an adult, you, do, you don't need to have your genes mutated. You can just don't do certain things and you will be fine. So as one of the David Liu, who's a, uh, a CRISPR researcher at, uh, at uh, Harvard, at this meeting, when He Jong Kui announced what he'd done, he said, what was the unmet medical need? I, why were you doing this? That what here could not be done simpler in any other way. And he had no answer because there was no unmet medical need. The key point to remember about these girls is that as embryos, they were perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with them at all. And He Jong Kui then did this experiment, believing the whole scissors business, and it didn't work. It went wrong. Not only did he not introduce the right mutations, uh, one of the mutations which he did introduce has never been seen in any other human. Not every cell of the girls is identical. Now, it should be. That's what you expect, because a single cell that's been mutated uh, all the mu then divides and all the subsequent cells should have the same DNA. That's normally the case in all of us. That's not the case in these girls. They have their mosaic. They're a mixture of genotypes. Now. With a bit of luck, none of this will matter. With a bit of luck, the girl's going to be fine. You can be mosaic and have no consequences. Uh, the mutations may not do anything of any great note. But just remember that the mutation he wanted to introduce actually makes it more likely you're going to get other diseases and may die of flu, for example. So <laughs> there's no, you know, there are swings and roundabouts to this. But above all, they were healthy until he got his hands on them. Now they are mutated. And this is a mutation, if they have children, that will be passed on to the next generation. You know, you do this and it's forever. So there is, you know, this was an absolute scandal and created, uh, I mean, it did two things. There was huge shock. I mean, it was immense, you know, and it's in particular because it's so badly done. Uh, you know, it was on, it was trending on Twitter under the hashtag CRISPR babies. And I mean, I wasn't at the meeting, but I was watching people who were watching the, the stream, stream of the, the meeting from Hong Kong were commenting on it and taking it apart brilliantly, some of them, analyzing scientists, analyzing the data they could see flashed up on the screen and criticizing it and saying, well, look, this is what's he done here. And everybody was absolutely furious. Um, and what it led to was actually the scientific, and bioethical community saying, well, 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 wait a minute, why are we doing this? <laughs> Which you would have thought would have been the question they should have asked first. But in the immediate run up to it, in the years running up to this, there had been a, uh, an acceptance that from 2015 onwards, that we were on what they called a prudent path to human germline editing. That is that it was something that was going to happen. And you just had to be a bit careful and it'd be fine. And nobody asked the absolutely ABC question, why are you going to do this? Now, after the Hedjokwi incident, catastrophe, whatever, scandal, whatever word you want to call it, um, people are now asking that question. The question, they realise that, in fact, very few people could actually benefit from this because most people say, oh, well, we could get rid of genetic diseases. And that seems, you know, Stephen Pinker got very aggressive back in 2015, saying the bioethics should get out of the way and let us get on with it. And, you know, we could save millions of lives. But that's just not true, because at the moment we have very effective ways of screening for genetic diseases. And in couples where both in couples that have a genetic disease in their family, you can do what's called pre uh, in, implantation screening. So the couples have to go through IVF. And I always pause at this point because generally men talk about how fantastic this is. And if anybody's been through IVF, and in particular women listening who've been through it, or friends or daughters or mothers have been through IVF, they will know it is no joke. It is really hard work for everybody. It's hard for the man as well because of the emotional stress. But I mean, let's just leave that to one side. IVF is not a joke, but you can do it. So the couple have 
IVF, and then you select from amongst the embryos those that are not affected, and you implant the embryos that are not affected, that are, that are healthy. And that's it. So how many couples could you treat using genetic engineering? How many couples could not use this much simpler, because you've got to go through IVF anyway, if you can have genetic engineering, but you know this much safer, simpler, established, accepted procedure. How many couples around the world would not could not benefit from that to get rid of, a, to have a baby that was biologically theirs and that was not affected by a genetic disease? Well, it turns out that it's perhaps a few hundred, literally, that is it, because only certain types of individual could benefit from this. In particular, uh, if you have what's called a recessive disease, so that's a disease that's expressed when you have two copies of the gene, one on each chromosome. If both couples are recessive for the same disease, then all of their offspring will be affected. So they would have to go through this procedure if they were to have a, an unaffected biological child. The other kind of people who could benefit from this are parents where one parent has two copies of what's called a dominant disease. And that's a disease where you only need one copy of the gene to be ill. So they've got two copies, and that means that all their offspring is going to have one and therefore will have the disease. So how many people are there who have two copies of dominant disease, like, say, Huntington's disease? We don't know the exact figures, but as I say, the estimates are that there are a few hundred such couples around the world. And so what you'd be doing was using this, is using this incredibly dangerous and un, unreliable technology, not to cure anybody of anything, but to allow a healthy child to be born. In other words, you're actually dealing with the desires of those couples to have a biological child who is unaffected by their genetic disease. And whilst that's quite understandable, and I completely get it, I don't think we should allow that. I think it's very sad for the couples involved, but not everybody can have a baby. It's not, you know, it's not given. That's not the way it works. Some people can't for all sorts of reasons. And those couples who clearly prepared to invest time and money and love into that process might be better off thinking about, OK, well, we'll adopt a child because there are plenty of children who are healthy and who are unwell, who need adopting. And maybe that's a better solution to find the love that they want in their life. Uh, and the money, you know, you want to save lives. I don't know, healthy, you know, clean sewage, sewage systems, clean water. That will so that will save far more lives than any fiddling around with genes and will be much, much safer. Well, we're then moving to the next way in which uh, people think CRISPR might save us all is gene drives. Um, th these are basically, um, oh, I don't know that I can describe it, but it's meant as a conservation tool. So go for it. Yeah, you're the one. Yeah. So, so these, uh, these were dream dreamt up as a way of dealing with what is an absolutely terrifying problem. OK, so you've got to start off by thinking any discussion of gene drives has to start with the reality that every year around about 600,000 people around the world die of malaria. The vast majority of them uh, are children under five. And there are other insect borne diseases which also kill, uh, make people in, you know, chronically ill and so on. So this is a massive global issue. And the idea was. Uh, this was dreamt up at the beginning of the century, was that you could develop a gene which would alter the physiology of your mosquito in some way, say, make it immune to malaria so it couldn't have the parasite in it, or would, better still, more simple, would make it sterile. And that you would introduce this gene and you'd change it in such a way that it would have alongside it, not just this gene, but also bits of DNA that would encode for the kind of molecular scissors I was describing earlier on. So what would happen is that you'd start off with a, a mosquito with two copies of this gene. OK, so all of its offspring is going to have one copy. OK, but if you didn't have this cleverness associated with it, what would mean was that gene, no matter what it did, whether it was to make the mosquito sterile or immune to malaria, would rapidly disappear in the population, simply because every generation it would be becoming less and less frequent. But these gene drives are very clever. What happens is that when fertilization occurs, so you've got one new weird chromosome and an ordinary chromosome, the 
DNA on the weird chromosome targets the same site on the uh, wild type, the normal chromosome, and cuts the DNA. And then the cell goes, oh, I've got a hole in me. I've got a bit of mixture. I've got a hole in my DNA. What's on the other chromosome? Oh, there's a nice bit of DNA. I'll copy it over. So now you've got two copies instead of one. And that will happen. That means that every offspring of that single individual now has two copies of the gene and the same in the next generation and the same in the next generation. In other words, you've got exponential growth. Or as the researchers put it, it's a who actually made the first people who actually made one of these things almost by accident. It's a genetic chain reaction. And that analogy with the atomic age, which we started off with, is actually very apt here. So you've got an, a, a, an, an amazing, astonishing power here. You could eliminate mosquitoes. But what would be the consequence? We don't know because we don't know enough about ecology. So this is both extremely exciting and somewhat alarming <laughs> because, you know, we do not know what would happen. Although it is the case that there's no mosquito species, which is the sole food source of any other animal. Right. So no animal is going to go starve to death for it. Right. But mosquitoes are eaten by vast numbers of different kinds of animal, both as larvae because they live in the water. So fish eat them, for example, and as flies, as adults. And so you wouldn't need to be you, all you'd need is for a few of those species to go a little bit hungry. Not starve, but a little bit hungry for their behavior to change for perhaps a local population to die down, to be reduced. And you start to get some kind of you know, uncontrollable ecological cascade. So that, you know, this is something that the researchers, I can't emphasize this enough, the researchers who are doing this work are intensely aware of, and they are also very concerned by. So right from the very outset, they have raised this possibility. And so there've been repeated discussions about whether, I mean, the research goes ahead, but at the moment there is an agreement informally more or less that this should none of these forms of life should be released anywhere in the world but on the other hand we've got 600,000 people dying every year so we've got to we come back to that that's the price we're paying for not you know, being ecologically pure we're allowing people to die so these are real ethical problems that are inherent in the science and were recognized as soon as it was being developed, just like back in 1971, when Paul Berg inadvertently could have introduced a cancer causing gene into a gut bacterium, that those dangers were raised. So uh, gene drives are astonishing, very alarming, and maybe yet again, they won't be necessary. So earlier this year, there is WHO approval for a new vaccine against uh, against malaria. And this has been the people have been searching for this for decades. So much work has gone into trying to find a malaria vaccine for all sorts of boring technical reasons. It hasn't been possible. Now they've had this trial which led to 80 percent success, which isn't fantastic. But that's enough to lower the level of, mos of malaria in the local population, which will mean eventually that the, when uh, you know, a, a malaria mosquito that doesn't have malaria, because that's how they start, they haven't got malaria when they emerge as a pup from the pupil case, when that bites somebody, it's just going to annoy them. It's not going to pick up malaria from them and then give it to somebody else because they'll be low enough levels. So again, it may be that we don't need this sexy, amazing technology because there's a much simpler, reliable, effective, tried and tested, safe procedure that we can employ. Shortly after I finished reading your book, I saw an article in The Guardian about um, research on a potential gene drive in a non-native species of mice in Australia, um, where they want to use the gene drive to make the mouse infertile. Um, but toward the end of the article, the lead researcher said something along the lines of that it'll be at least five years before there's any field test of this. It's always five years. Your book. Yes. It's always five years. <laughs> Whenever anybody on a completely unrelated link, a certain person yesterday 
uh, at Neuralink, his, uh, one of his many companies, said, well, in five years' time, we're going to be sticking this little chip in your brain. Well, it's always five years, you know. I don't know why. Technologists love five years. It's, it's close enough to seem real and distant enough for everybody to soon forget about the promise, you know, not, not call people out on it. <laughs> but to come so, back to that, so at the, moment, at the moment, so even that study, it's not yet possible. There's no, in mammals, no gene drive has been created that will, that actually works and has been shown to work down the generations. Okay, so they can get the first kind of swapping over or copying over of the, the, the character into uh, the other chromosome. That's that they've been able to do. But then unlike in mosquitoes and in other organisms, in insects, they haven't been able to show that this will carry on for several generations and expand in a population. So at the moment, this hasn't been done. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is, this is kind of the irony. We've got these pests, which we've introduced <laughs> And now they're plan we're planning on effectively introducing a new kind of pest, which is going to be this um, gene-driven mouse, which will pass its genes on and get rid of the, uh, the invasive species. But in a way, we're, we're creating another invasive species. Uh, and I think an awful lot of thought has got to be put into, you know, whether this is at all a good idea. Um, and, you know, you've got to be where absolutely confident that the genes can't get out into other species because interspecific mating is rare, but it does occur. And it's possible that the, through one of these rare events, if that gene drive got into uh, a, 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 you know, some uh, marsupial that lives uh, in Australia, then that or even mammalian rodents, because there are there are placental, some placental mammals like the rodents that uh, are these pests if they were to get the gene drive then you might wipe out what you're trying to save uh, and so the i mean this has got to be really thought hard about by both the technologists by ecologists above all but also by bioethicists by the local community where these animals live and it's not enough just to say well this sounds great you know here's a fantastic techno fix uh, but i mean i think what I can't emphasize enough is in the, all the cases I've looked at, everybody is well-meaning. I haven't, I mean, I, I have been, I have felt some people were foolhardy and haven't thought hard enough about it, but I haven't ever in any of the research thought you are really crazy and you are trying deliberately to do something dangerous. So, I mean, we should be wary, but there are no Victor Frankensteins out there setting on doing something that they know is dangerous for, I mean, with the probable exception of her John Quee. And I think he was actually a bit dim and didn't realize what he was doing, the extent of it. You know, uh, he thought he was going to get a Nobel prize. He's become an unperson. He was sentenced to jail for three years, you know, um, but in general, the, you know, people are very, very careful. They come from a science that has this tradition of thinking about the problems because their technology is self-replicating. And in the case of gene drives and how, you know, it's the ultimate self-replicator. Well, while we're on the subject of conservation and replication, um, you, you bring up these ideas for de-extinction, proposals to bring back the woolly mammoth or the Tasmanian tiger or other extinct species using their DNA. Um, the, <laughs> Just as you point out, which is a common theme of these, it's just much more complicated than it sounds on a surface level explainer. So what are some of the issues yeah. here? OK, so, well, I mean, initially when so we've got the mammoth genome, and this is amazing. Just got to think about this. We've got genomes from organisms that are extinct for tens of thousands of years. I mean, in fact, the last mammoths went extinct. It's bizarre. People don't realize this. They actually went extinct at the same time as the pyramids were being built. Uh, now, these weren't your impressive big mammoths that we had up here in Manchester, when, when, you know, set 15, 17,000 years ago when there was 100 metres of ice above where I am now. Uh, instead, these were actual dwarf mammoths that lived on a place called Wrangell Island, which is uh, off Alaska. Uh, but so they hung around for a long, long time. But anyway, I mean, that, that I think is amazing. We can get ancient DNA from these animals. And so... The idea is, I mean, who wouldn't want to see a mammoth? Well, I'd like to see a mammoth. That's you know, I'm not messing about here. I'd love to see a mammoth, but I think it is, it is one, intensely difficult, in, not actually impossible, 
for reasons I'll outline, but I also think it's extremely unethical. So for the unethical reasons, just to deal with that very quickly, how are you going to, you can't just get a load of DNA and expect it to turn into a, a mammoth. You've got to, you need a cell, you need an egg cell. You've got to reprogram the egg cell by introducing DNA from a mammoth. Now, we can do this, or we have, we, you know, scientists have been able to do this with one bacteria. Yeah, actually, anybody, we, you know, everybody. They've done this with one bacteria, which has a single chromosome. And they were able to take the, uh, the chromosome out and they made an artificial chromosome and put it in. And the whole thing has kickstarted and is now alive. So you've got an artificial DNA sequence running uh, this little microbe and it will divide and do all the things that microbes should do. But that's a microbe, right? It's got one circular chromosome. That took, uh, the initial stages of that, I think took about 20 years, yeah, of some real hot shot, hot shot geneticists. Now, a mammoth, if you were to say, okay, well, wait a minute, we'll, we'll get rid of all those cell, those chromosomes in what? We haven't got any mammoth cells. They don't, they're dead. Right. You've got DNA, but that's only because DNA is like a library and it was preserved. All the cells are dead. So you're going to have to use an elephant. That's the closest relative. You're going to have to use an Asian elephant. That's the closest relative we've got. But you know what? Asian elephants are a bit smaller than mammoths were. I mean, apart from the, the, the mini mammoths on Wrangell Island, the mammoths that people want, the big, huge, you know, stomping around the European tundra mammoths, um, they were a lot bigger. So. You might have a problem, even if you could do this, in actually getting this thing coming to term. You'd probably have to do a, um, you probably have to do a cesarean. Now, I don't know anybody who's ever done a cesarean on an Indian elephant, and I don't know what the ethics of that. But let's say we can do that, or let's say you can get it to be emerge, be born the normal way, and it this this hairy thing emerges into a world of. Asian elephants. Now, what are they going to think about it? Uh, elephants are normally really ha excited and happy when there's a new birth and they trumpet it and everything and they pick it up and they, they chuck dirt all over it. So the smell of the birth isn't available to uh, predators. But they're going to have this thing which is completely different, is a completely different species. They split apart, I've forgotten, three million years ago. It will smell different. It will behave differently. It's hairy. I mean, maybe it's going to be rejected. Maybe they'll be fine. Maybe it'll be rejected. Then what happens? We've got this orphan, you know, elephants and mammoths were social organisms. We've got this orphan, this miserable, sad, the only one in the world. I mean, how can that be a good thing? I mean, it's just awful ethically. I, mean, I can't begin to get over quite how miserable that could be. And then we get onto the technical side because, you know, okay, you can't do that. Um, but maybe we could introduce some of the chromosomes rather than emptying the whole thing. We could add some chromosomes. How many chromosomes does uh, an, uh, an Indian elephant have, have? Well, I can't remember. I think it's 47 pairs. I've forgotten the number. But I know that a mammoth, we don't know how many chromosome pairs it had. So we can't just match them up. We don't know because we can get the DNA. Out. We don't find whole chromosomes that you can kind of then chisel away in the ice. That's not the way it works. You get DNA out and it's all in bits and you have to stick it together in your computer program to work out what the sequence was. So we don't know how many differences there are between these two, gene, two genomes. We don't know what they're significant. So as a result of all these criticisms, which were first made when the, the idea was first raised back in 2013 by, by George Church, they've now said, OK, well, we're not actually going to do that. We're going to mammothify an Asian elephant. And there's all sorts of reasons that are given for changing the carbon in the melting tundra and all the rest of it. I think it's all rubbish. Um, but, you know, I mean, let's just leave it. Never mind about the application. Just think about the technicalities. They're going to mammothify a, uh, a, an Asian elephant. They're going to find the genes in the mammoth that are involved in, say, being hairy, in uh, resisting cold temperatures, or various other things, and they're going to put them into a uh, an elephant. And because they're worried about the growth business that I said, maybe the embryo are too big, they're going to do this in an artificial womb. Right. Artificial womb. Do they exist? No. Or rather, they exist for rats up to about two weeks, I think they've got them, or maybe they've done it with a lamb, I can't remember. But only if they, no animal has been brought to term. Plus, how big? Does a baby mammoth grow? 
It's the size of a small car. So this thing is this thing is going to have to be immense and it doesn't exist. So I know that a lot of I mean, it's gets huge press and influencers have invested vast sums of money in it. Well, good luck to them. They have probably bought NFTs as well. That'll teach them. You know, this is not I mean, it is just I think it is unethical if it were to work because these are social organisms. I think it is it. it I mean, I get the the vague idea. Wouldn't it be amazing? But then you've just got to think a bit about what is amazing and the animals that we've got already that are under threat. And I can't help thinking that so much of this effort, you know, the mammoths are gone. The dinosaurs, apart from their descent, their relatives, the birds have gone. You just got to accept that we can stop future extinctions. And that's where the emphasis should be, including in using fancy genetics, because that's all that's been done by some of the same companies have uh, helped to uh, clone uh, examples of black footed ferrets, which are under extreme threat in the USA to try and, you know, they've got cell lines uh, that have been maintained from animals that died decades ago. And they've used that DNA to create new black footed ferrets, which with a completely different genetic sequence from those that are now around and have become extremely inbred. So that's great because they're going to introduce new genes into the population. So I'm not against using fancy techniques for saving animals, but I really would like to save the ones that save the ones that we've got at the moment, rather than dreaming of, you know, making bizarre mammothified elephants and thinking that we've done something amazing. I, I think it's, it's miserable. But I, I do. So I want to get to the, the third application you said made you write this book, um, which is sort of something we talked about at the beginning, uh, has been a fear kind of from the beginning of genetic engineering, which is fear of some sort of deadly pathogen, um, in this case, like leaking out of a lab. Um, some of the studies you talk about are called gain of function research, which yeah. sort of from the name, you get the idea that it's just kind of you can take a pathogen and make it more dangerous. That's it. Science, uh, <laughs> which sounds scary. Um, sounds crazy. So is, yeah. Is there real scientific benefit here? Or, you know, are we just doing it you know, because we can? No, we're not no doing it because we can. Yeah. I mean, so there is a dispute about this. And I'm not a virologist. OK. So I only know about maggots. So I'm not studying epidemiology, how pandemics evolve and change. I'm not a virologist studying them, you know, really having this as my life's work and trying to save lives through it. So I, I recognize and accept the authority and integrity of the researchers who are doing this work. I also think they're wrong, which I'm allowed to say, you know, I mean, but I, I preface all my comments with that this is, again, <laughs> well-meaning research. So the idea was uh, and this came about at the beginning of the century, partly as a consequence of SARS, which was the first major spillover event, which we had seen kind of happening in real time and being able to fully understand. Um, and it was kind of a, a precursor of um, of COVID uh, it was dealt with in China through basic uh, health procedures and was able to be stopped with only in inverted commas, a few hundred people uh, dying. But what that coupled with the um the al qaeda attacks in the usa in the usa that led to a growing awareness not only of the potential for uh spillover events but for the potential uh, for terrorists to use this technology potentially to create new terrible weapons so a great deal of investment came from the usa or inside the usa to encourage people to start studying what was possible in other words, the idea being either something bad was going to happen in a bat or was going to happen in a terrorist lair and we could face ourselves with a new pandemic. What could happen? That's the kind of the basic argument. And therefore, you can be prepared for it because you can predict what will happen and you can have perhaps the relevant vaccines or whatever ready to deal with that. Now, a lot of the or all, it must be said, of the uh, the, the terrorist motivated panic was panic and nonsense. Although we know that Al Qaeda was interested in creating, in trying to create such bioweapons, it was unable to do so. It failed because it's really very, very hard. I think that's the key thing. This is not easy science. And so they, they, we know from their documents that they were interested in doing this, 
partly because they'd read that the West said, oh, this new technique is really easy. Everybody, everybody can do it. And they thought, OK, right, let's have a go. Um, but they weren't able to do it, thankfully. But in the early years of the century, there was huge interest, and a lot of money in the USA devoted to this gain of function. What could possibly happen and how can we be prepared for it? Not prevent it, but be prepared for it. Um, and in particular, this focused on uh, diseases uh, and it went hand in hand with things like people, um, you know, some some conservation scientists accidentally, this literally what happened, they were dealing with mice, we're back with the mice in Australia. Australian conservation scientists wanted to release a form of uh, a virus called mousepox, which is closely related to smallpox. They wanted to release mousepox to get rid of these uh, these marsupial, sorry, these uh, placental mammal mice that are an invasive species. So they're doing some studies on this, trying to infect them with a disease that would kill them, right? Um, and they were messing around with mousepox and they changed it in such a way that it meant that it could now not be prevented by a vaccination because there were vaccines against mousepox, which they were studying. And what they found was that this new virus that they had inadvertently changed could now escape the vaccine, as it's called. And what that meant, and everybody recognized this immediately, including the researchers, is given the similarity with smallpox, this meant that it was possible to create a smallpox virus that could escape the vaccines that people of my age and many people down to, I forgot when they stopped vaccinating against smallpox, uh, you know, we've eradicated it from the wild. It lurks in freezers in a few places around the world, some of which are known and others of which are regularly discovered by accident. Literally, people find in minus 80 freezers a vile mark smallpox. I mean, that happened when I was writing the book. Absolutely terrifying. Um, plus, to really frighten people, there are buried bodies in the permafrost that is melting. And so it's not a complete, and from which we have been able to extract living or, or smallpox that can be revived. So it is possible that the melting permafrost could lead to kind of zombie smallpox particles emerging. I mean, that, that's probably not going to happen, but it's not a complete, it's not completely impossible. So all this led to great panic and a focus on infectious diseases, which has been great in one way, because we have had, an, we had another infective disease, infectious disease, MERS, uh, which uh, is still going on in the Middle East. Uh, which is really dangerous, but we've been able to contain it by basic uh, public health procedures. And then there's been H5N1. H5N1 is bird flu. Um, and this is pretty dangerous in people, but you've got to be in physical contact. So at the moment in the UK, we've got an H5N1 pandemic in the birds. So loads of birds are dying around our coast. It's really horrible. We're having to keep all the chickens and turkeys inside. So there will be no free range turkeys for Christmas because they can't go out because they could get ill. Um, and one of the things that people began to study was, well, this limiting factor on H5N1, which prevents it being really, really dangerous in humans, it's far worse than COVID, uh, is that you can't, it's not respiratory. So the thing about COVID was all that fuss at the beginning, how is it transmitted? And all the nonsense that still goes on about masks, it's respiratory. You get it by, you know, breathing in infected air. And the particles float about and you breathe them in and you get ill. That doesn't happen with H5N1 until in 20, 2011, uh, a, uh, a Dutch scientist called Ron Fouchier, or a scientist working in Rotterdam called Don, Ron Fouchier, he announced to a conference uh, in, uh, in Malta, he said, I've done something really, really stupid. Those are his words. He said, I have, quote, mutated the hell out of H5N1 and now enabled it to be transmitted through the air. And mammals, ferrets that he was studying, could get it if they were in adjoining cages. They would transmit it one to the other. So very soon, another group said, yeah, hey, we've done the same thing. So this did two things. One, it showed that we've got a real problem with H5N1. Because if we can mutate the hell out of it, then it can mutate itself by chance. Random chance can lead to a transmissible form of H5N1, and then the world will be in real trouble. So this, was a, this is a real warning. It was also absolutely terrifying, because what if this gets out? What if there is a lab leak? And uh, immediately, Fouchier and his colleagues, all the researchers, said, wrote a letter to Nature saying, right, we've got to have a moratorium on this. 
And so it ended up being about for eight months that until they could find new biosecurity protocols, uh, they didn't do this research. But just like in a cinema, they didn't say, should we be doing this? In the words of, I've forgotten his name, in uh, Jurassic Park, your scientists were so busy thinking about whether they could, they didn't bother thinking about whether they should. Uh, and we're, that's the situation today. There's been a, uh, there was a, for all sorts of reasons, uh, the U.S. reduced funding for uh, gain-of-function studies, and now it's started up again. Uh, and there is, I think, the scientific community is not of one voice on this. Clearly, Fushi and the others, who are absolutely well-intentioned, right? They want to know how bad could it be. There are those of us who think, well, you know, we, we know it's going to be bad. And if it comes, like we saw with COVID, we can respond. So the, the argument they use is that this will enable us to meet future pandemics. None of their research was of any use in responding to COVID. OK, so I think the proof of the pudding at the moment is that this is not helpful research and it's clearly dangerous. I'd also I absolutely must emphasize that there is no evidence that COVID was engineered. Uh, COVID was a spillover event from uh, almost certainly from bats. Remember, it took us 15 years to identify precisely where uh, SARS came from. It's very hard to do. We're getting closer and closer in the case of COVID. There's no evidence that it was engineered. There's no evidence that it was leaked from a lab by accident that, you know, the Chinese were studying it in Wuhan and something went wrong and it got out of the lab. That's possible, but it's much more likely from all the evidence we have that it was a spillover event in the Wuhan market, which right from the outset was seen as being uh, the focus of the disease outbreak. Yeah, well, um, you know, you, you briefly mentioned Jurassic Park. One of the things that was fun in the book is that you, throughout you talk about how science fiction and other pop culture engaged with these ideas. Um, but yeah, I, just to kind of sum us up, um, you, you bring up that you're alarmed about some of these particular strands of research, um, but not saying we should not pursue any of it either. Um, and why you write the book and why I'm bringing you on the podcast is that these are issues that the public should understand more and they're complicated and politicians aren't talking about CRISPR on TV, uh, but they are, they are issues that we should be learning about and that there should be fora and, and spaces where, um, you know, communities and the public at large can be engaged in whether we release a gene drive or what type of research we do and don't regulate. Um, so just to, to sum up, do you have anything, um, any last words you want to add about kind of the, the future? Well, I think that the future has got to be one of regulation. I don't, I, you know, I, I, the problem is that this is, these are international issues. Just take the issue of gene drives. You can imagine why, uh, you know, a village in Burkina Faso, which is losing lots of its children to, to malaria, might absolutely desperately want to have gene drive mosquitoes, be very keen on it. I mean, I, you know, I understand that. But the problem is if we say, OK, right, let the public decide, let this community decide, is that those mosquitoes aren't going to stay in that village. They move. That's how Zika got from Africa. The Zika virus, which caused such a fuss in the, the, the Rio Olympics, um, the Zika virus got from Africa where it was, it still is and is okay. It's not, it's a bit like having flu, but it moved with the mosquitoes across the South Atlantic in ships or on ships and then ended up changing once it got to South America and became a really, really nasty disease. Um, we're a global planet. So we need to have global systems of regulation, either through the WHO for uh, issues associated with gene therapy or some new institution uh, when it comes to gain of function research or gene drives. Things like the International Atomic Energy or, or, or Authority or like the International Civil Aviation Organization. These are structures that embody all countries and represent all countries and control what is very dangerous technology. I mean, getting on a plane is potentially lethal, all right? But in general, you can do it very safely. And that's because the rules have been worked out, partly the result of past catastrophes, partly because of people thinking ahead and trying to think what could go wrong and making rules to prevent that. And they are then established and, and applied. 
And there are sanctions, for example, in the case of the Atomic Energy Authority, if a country like, say, Iran decides to not obey the rules, then there are sanctions that are applied. And I think you need similar kind of structures uh, globally to be able to do that. We have something called the Biological Weapons Convention, which was set up in 1972, the same time as the um, as the genetic engineering became a reality, but it has no teeth. It has no, can't send in inspectors. If anybody's found in breach of that, like the Soviet Union, which of course signed the, the treaty and said, yes, of course we agree with this. And then just completely ignored it. Or South Africa, which did exactly the same uh, and created bioweapons. Um, they have no power. There's no power of sanction. So it's effectively, it's a dead letter. We need to have such international structures. And that's where it gets really difficult. Because the world, and in particular the USA, has no appetite for this at the moment. You know, the USA is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court. So citizens who do terrible things cannot be prosecuted. Whereas, you know, if you've been in, engaged in genocide uh, in uh, Yugoslavia, then you can be you can be tried by the civil court, international civilian international criminal court. People have been. U.S. citizens cannot be because what well, the U.S. will not recognize it. So we need some, there's got to be a deeper change, not just about genetics. Yes, the public needs to be involved, but we also need to understand that this technology requires a planetary response so that it can be applied in the safe and effective and useful way that it can be. Because without that, there will be, you know, there's going to be national disparities and things could go wrong because one country has lower levels of regulation than another. And that, I think, is that's the ultimate lesson. I mean, I am both, uh, as I said at the end of the book, I'm a, I'm a warrior and a warrior. I'm both in favor of this technology. I'm also concerned about how it is applied. And we need structures that can ensure with public involvement that these are, uh, this technology is regulated in an effective way so that its power can be harnessed and used for good, used for the good of everybody and not just a few. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. Um, and yeah, the, the book is As Gods, A Moral History of the Genetic Age. Um, there's a lot more there um, if you want to pick it up. And uh, Matthew Cobb, thanks so much for coming on the show. That's been great, Dayton. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you got a lot to think about and chew on, whether you agree or disagree. And yeah, I just want to sort of capstone this with the importance I feel there is in in democracy, in the public knowing about scientific progress, whether that's CRISPR, whether that's self-driving cars, whether that's geoengineering or certain conservation strategies, and be able to weigh in and have informed opinions on sort of whether and how these technologies are used, where they're used, where they're not used, how they're regulated, and not just sort of have the world happen um, with us as mere observers and not as democratic participants. This theme of who has the power to make decisions about technologies that affect the whole globe um, in the geoengineering context is the theme of the novel Appleseed. I interviewed the author Matt Bell um, earlier this year in one of my earlier episodes, and that is going to be uh, our February book club, most likely at the end of February, um, Tuesday, February 28th, we'll be discussing that one, so get your copies now. And uh, if you liked this podcast, please follow it, like it, subscribe, share, um, consider a small monthly donation on Patreon. All that info is in the episode description. Thank you to those who already do support this podcast on Patreon. Thank you to the subscribers to my free newsletter. Um, thank you to the iRoar Podcast Network, a network of pro-animal podcasts, of which I'm part. Um, I hope Hope you appreciated the uh, segment on woolly mammoths in particular. Um, and yeah, thanks to all you listeners. Have a great day. Hi. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah.